morning, everyone, and uh, welcome um, online students, also our e-learning students who will be listening to these uh, classes or lectures afterwards, and also uh, welcome to our in-person students as well. Okay, let's uh, begin class. Can I ask one of our online students to lead us in prayer this morning, please? Anyone can lead us in prayer? Bhikkhu, can you lead us in prayer, please? Bhikkhu or Arilla, anyone? Okay. Uh, can I ask Rin? Rin, can you lead us in prayer, please? There's no response from Bhikkhu and Arilla. Okay, let's pray. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, uh, for this um, for this time and for bringing us all together to attend our classes. And um, and Lord, I pray that. Um, you would open our hearts and our mind and you help us, Lord, to understand and to be able to grasp um, what is being taught today. And, uh, and Lord, I pray that um, you help uh, Pastor Selena to teach what she has to teach us and that, um, and that we would learn from this, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I submit this class into your hands. In the name of pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, so last week we were... Um studying the substitutionary uh, work of Jesus Christ, okay? Uh, that is chapter 10. We looked at how uh, Christ became, uh, you know, took our place. Substitutionary sacrifice means somebody else taking the place for uh, someone else, okay? So how Jesus Christ took our place, okay? He became sin for us. He took our curse, he died on our behalf, uh, he took our grief, our sorrows, our infirmities, our uh, iniquities, our transgressions. Um, he took upon himself our sickness, uh, our curse, even took upon himself death so that we can have the fullness of life, the eternal life, the Zoe life, the God kind of life. Uh, we can be free from... Uh, the penalty of sin, the punishment of sin, the dominion of sin, uh, also free from death and every curse and every bondage and sickness and disease and infirmities because he took it all upon himself. So Christ, you know, taking our place, taking upon himself everything that we had to bear, uh, he bore it upon himself. And not only he took upon himself our sickness, our death, uh, and eternal hell, but he also, uh, or the punishment for our sins, but he also took upon himself our sicknesses, our grief, our transgressions, our iniquities, um, so that we can uh, experience the fullness of life, the God kind of life. Okay? So do we experience the eternal life um, um, only after we go to heaven? When do we experience eternal life? When do we experience eternal life? From the starting of your birth. When you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, right? From that very moment you experience uh, the, the eternal life, but the fullness or the completeness of this eternal life you experience, um, uh, you experience when? When you get to heaven, okay? So eternal life is uh, not something that is a future hope which we look for with anticipation and with confidence. It's a surety that we are going to experience eternal life. But eternal life is not something that is an eschatological hope. You know what is eschatology? Something way into the 
future. It's not an, just an eschatological hope, but it is a realized eschatology as well, which means realized eschatology means something that we will, ex the future hope, the future promise, we also experience it part here and now. Okay, so how, where does in the Bible does it say that, you know, we can experience eternal life here and now, the everlasting life? John 3, 36. Can somebody read John 3, 36, please? He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. And he who does not believe, the son shall not see life, but the breath of God abides on him. Yes, so here it says, he who believes in the son will have everlasting life or will have eternal life. And those who don't believe will not have eternal life. So eternal life is something which is an eschatological hope, something that is way in the future, we will experience it. But it's also realized eschatology, we can experience it here and um, now. So here, when we believe in Jesus, when we are born again, like uh, Mina John says, you know, we can experience eternal um, life. Okay, so that is what uh, we looked at last week. We studied the substitutionary work of uh, uh, Jesus Christ. We just had to look at one point, uh, the last point, he tasted death for everyone. Okay, so Jesus not only took upon himself our sins, our sickness, our poverty, de uh, curse, shame, uh, sickness and disease, but he also took upon himself death. He died on our behalf. Why should he die on our behalf? Why is death? Why should there be death? For the wages of sin is? Death. Yes, the consequence of sin is death. Okay, so the wages of sin is death. Hence, Jesus experienced or tasted death for everyone so that we can experience eternal life. We can experience the God kind of um, life. Okay, so any questions uh, regarding chapter 10, the substitutionary sacrifice of the work of Jesus Christ? Any questions? No? Any questions from our online students? OK, if there are no questions, then we we'll move on to uh, the next chapter, chapter 11. But if you remember in, you know, in the first few classes when, or the first class when we studied what is Christology all about? You know, so we said in Christology, what will we study about? Anyone remembers? What will we study about in Christology? Can you take the mic so that, yeah. What do we study in Christology? How to uh, say that Jesus is God using uh, scriptures? How to defend okay. our... What is Christology? Study about Christ. Study. study about Christ? Christology, yes, a study about Christ, but what about Christ? There's so many different dimensions, aspects. How he how he is fully God and fully human. How divinity and humanity coexisted in the person of Jesus, Jesus Christ. Please please learn that up so that even when I wake you up in your sleep and ask you, <laughs> you all will be able to say it. Yes, thank you, Jacqueline. Uh, how incarnation and deity, or how humanity and deity coexisted. That is important. The word coexisted is very important because in Christ, there was he was 100% man, 100% God. He was fully God, fully man. So how humanity and deity coexisted? You know what I mean of coexisted, right? I mean, existing together. How can it coexist in the person of Jesus Christ? That is the definition for Christology. But I'm asking, what do we study in Christology? The study of Christology includes what? Huh? 
Hello, you are looking like you just uh, come for the first course in Christ first class in Christology. What do we study in Christology? What have you studied all these last weeks? Okay, Jackin says the nature of Jesus Christ. Okay, um, how Jesus uh, existed before time began and his pre-existence. Yes, thank you. So we studied first his pre-existence. Thank you. At least one student remembers what we studied in the very beginning. Anina John also says the pre-existence of Christ. Okay, what else did we study? The pre-existence of Christ. The equality to the Father and uh, to the Holy Spirit. That means we spoke about what? His eternal nature. Okay, the eternal nature of Jesus Christ. What else did we study? Sorry? Okay, that is his eternal nature. What else did we study? Okay, that is his eternal nature, which we studied about. That is eternal nature again. <laughs> okay, incarnation. Yeah, humanity of Jesus Christ. Yes, the incarnation. Okay. We studied about his incarnation. We studied about his deity. We studied about his humanity. Uh, we studied about his pre existence, his eternal nature. We looked at the Old Testament prophecies concerning Jesus Christ. What else did we study about? The purpose of incarnation. Okay. Virginal conception. Sorry, virginal conception. Okay. Okay. We studied about his sinlessness, right? We studied about his death, okay? And now what else is left to study about Christ? His resurrection. His resurrection? Substitution ho gaya. <laughs> his, uh, his resurrection? Ascension. His ascension, his exaltation, and his return, okay? So... Basically, in Christology, we will be studying about, we studied about his pre-existence, the eternal nature of Jesus Christ, the Old Testament prophecies that talk about uh, Christ. We studied about Christ's humanity, uh, his deity, his incarnation, uh, his sinlessness, uh, his, um, now we'll, we'll look about his death. Uh, we, we studied his death as well. We'll now study his, re his resurrection his ascension, his exaltation, and his return, okay? So please look into your um, course notes, uh, chapter 11. Chapter 11 just has titles and has a whole list of um, uh, scripture passages which we have to read, but I will uh, also add uh, some more content which we can look at and understand uh, the whole dimension of Christ's resurrection and his exaltation, okay? So we see first that, uh, you know, anytime we study about any aspect of uh, Christ, we look at anything, any doctrine. Christology is a doctrine, right? And what are the other doctrines? Word of God. What are the other doctrines? Huh? Word of God, man, trinity, sin, salvation, justification, uh, righteousness, all of those, sanctification, all are doctrines, okay? So when we study about the do any doctrines, we look at it in the entirety of the entire scripture. What is spoken of in the Old Testament? what is the New Testament, and we study from the entirety of Scripture. We just don't take a few passages and study, but look at it in the in entirety. That means in the holistic view of what Scripture has to talk about a particular doctrine. So when we're talk, uh, studying about the doctrine of Jesus Christ, we're studying about Christology, we'll, we, for each chapter, we studied, we looked at what it says in the Old Testament, and we also look at what it says in the New Testament. So basically, Old Testament uh, is the fulfillment of what we see in the 
New Testament that is in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And that is why when we study about Christology, when we study about the person and work of Jesus Christ, we have to see how, you know, what is spoken in the Old Testament and how it's fulfilled in the person and work of uh, Jesus Christ. So was Christ's resurrection foretold in the Old Testament? Yes. Where is it foretold? Okay. Um, in Acts chapter 2, you know, on the day of Pentecost, after uh, all the 120 in the upper room were baptized in the Holy Spirit, and there was a big crowd that was gathered and they all thought was wondering how these men of Galilee were speaking in different languages from the different countries or places they came from. They were shocked and all of them said that, you know, they're speaking different languages, but they're speaking and they're worshipping and praising uh, God. And some of them mocked them and said they were all drunk. And then Peter, you know, he preaches uh, a message to them. And when he's speaking about the message he's basically talking about who jesus is what was foretold uh, in the old testament prophecies even about this um, you know joel's prophecy coming true about the um, you know them being baptized in the holy spirit and then he goes on to talk about the person and work of jesus christ and when he comes to the resurrection of jesus christ he says this is also foretold in the uh, Old Testament. Okay, so Peter is here speaking under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And then when he comes to the point where he's finished talking about the birth and the life and the ministry and the death of Jesus Christ, and he talks about the resurrection, he again, you know, quotes from the Old Testament, which proves that, you know, uh, Jesus' resurrection was spoken of in the Old Testament. So look at what he says. Peter, Apostle Peter says in Acts chapter 2, verses 29 uh, to 32. So can one, one of you please read that? Acts chapter 2, verse 29 to 32. Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch, patriarch. Pat, patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had his stone with an oath to him that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. He foreshaking, this is spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not uh, left in heads, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father, Father the, the thirty-two uh, promise of is completed. Okay. So, when Apostle Peter is talking, he is talking here about he's giving reference to uh, the patriarch David. And uh, he's actually quoting from what David, the Psalm, uh, Psalm chapter 16, verses 9 to 11. So can one of someone else read Psalm 16, verse 9 to 11, please? Psalm 16, 9 to 11. Therefore, my heart is... Yeah. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will rest in hope. For you will not leave my soul in Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Okay, so here actually this verses 16 to 19 is basically David is ascribing this uh, verses to himself. Okay, it's not here talking about the Holy One. It's not just talking about um, um, Jesus Christ. But here it's basically talking about uh, David. So there is a big uh, debate from scholars and theologians regarding the interpretation of this for centuries. Actually, uh, they say that Psalm 16 was written by King David 
and they believe that this holy one is in reference to David himself because he was an anointed king of uh, Israel. However, you know, we see that uh, um, the apostle Peter, you know, he takes this and he uses it or ascribes this as a prophecy talking about uh, Jesus Christ and hence he's saying this is the fulfillment of what was spoken and uh, hence uh, Apostle Peter quotes Acts chapter 2 verse 25 to 31 uh, and he says this applies to Jesus Christ um, and if you look at verses 26 um, 25 to 28 can somebody read that piece the same Psalm Psalm chapter 16 verse 25 to 28 can pass on that mic to somebody else so they can read. There is no Acts. Uh, uh? Sorry, uh, not uh, Psalm 16. Acts chapter 2, verses 25 to 28. Sorry. Acts 2, 25 to 28. Keep passing the mic after you all. David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest in hope. Because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead. You will not let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. So what Peter is basically saying here is the Patriarch David, you know, uh, He's saying, you people know that the patriarch David is both dead and buried, okay? Uh, verses 29 to 32, what we read, okay? And his tomb is there till to this day. He's not resurrected. He's, his tomb is still there today. He's dead and he's buried. But look at what he says. And then he's quoting and he's saying, you know, 20, verses 25 to 28. He's emphasizing here that Christ's body rose from the dead from the grave, unlike David. David's body, his tomb is still today, but Christ's tomb is empty. Okay, so unlike the patriarch David, you know, uh, Christ has resurrected, you know, and hence uh, there is a reason here. He says, my body, the patriarch David has said, because Christ will rise up from the dead, you know, I have this assurance, I have this hope that I will also my body will also live in hope because you will not abandon me to the grave. Okay. So basically, when you look at the Old Testament, this psalm was written by David. And, uh, you know, he's basically ascribing him, it to himself and has this hope that, you know, his body will rise up one day and he will have, uh, you know, he will not be abandoned to the grave, but he has this hope that he will uh, see eternal life. He will live eternally. And I'm sure this is all by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Okay. But then Peter uses this uh, phrase, your Holy One, to ascribe this to Jesus and says, you know, this was prophesied by the patriarch David saying that, you know, Christ will resurrect. And just like it is said, he resurrected. But, you know, um, unlike David, the patriarch David, who's still dead and buried, you know, Christ has risen. And because Christ, the Messiah, is, will rise up one day, you know, we have that hope of eternal life. And that was what uh, the patriarch David wrote about. Okay, so here P Apostle Peter is quoting from Acts chapter, sorry, from Psalms chapter 16, uh, looking at the hope of the uh, uh, eternal life that we have and also uh, the the fulfillment of what was prophesied there in psalm chapter 16 that the holy one will rise and will not be abandoned to the grave okay so that is the explanation of acts chapter 2 verses 29 to uh, 32 and what we see in psalm chapter uh, 16 okay verses 9 to um, 11 so we also see that Jesus himself foretold of his resurrection in many ways. Uh, so we'll read, uh, one of you can please read Matthew 16, 21. Uh, someone else can read Matthew 17, 22 to 23. And someone else can read uh, Matthew 26, 30 to 32. 
John chapter 2, verses 18 uh, to 22. Okay, and last reference is Luke chapter 24, verses 1 to 8. So we can have different people read these uh, different references, please, clearly and loudly. Who's going to begin? Matthew 16, 21. From that time, Jesus began to point out to his disciples that it was necessary for him to go to Jerusalem and to suffer many things from the elders, chief priests and scribes, and to be killed and to be raised up on the third day. So here we see that Jesus foretells that he will be you know, killed, but he will rise up on the third day. Matthew 17, 22 to 23. Matthew 17, 22 to 23. When they came together in Galilee, he said to them, the son of man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him. And on the third day, he will be raised to life. And the disciples were filled with grief. Okay, so he says he, they will kill him, and but he will rise up on the third day. Matthew 26, 30 to 32. Read the one. Matthew 26, 30 to 30. You can pass that mic to somebody else. Yeah. Matthew 26, 30. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said to them, All of you will be made to stumble because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. Okay, thank you. Um, so here we see that Jesus is saying that he as a shepherd, you know, will be killed, um, and the, the sheep, the flock will be scattered. But he says he will be he will raise up and then he promises to meet them in Galilee. Okay, John chapter 2 was 18 to 22. John 2, 18 to 22. So the Jews answer and say to him, What sign do you show to us since you do those things? Jesus answered and said to them, Destroy this temple, and these three days I will rise it up. Then the Jews said, it has, take, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, and will you rise it up in three days? But he, say, he was speaking of the temple of his body. Therefore, when he had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this to them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. Okay, so again here, uh, another, uh, you know, reference to when Jesus is foretelling about his death and his resurrection. And when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered what they said and they believed the scripture because he was also quoting from, uh, you know, the Old Testament. Okay. Luke 24, verses 1 to 8. Now, <clears throat> now on the first day of the week, every early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb bringing the spices which they had prepared but they found the stone rolled away from the tomb then they went in and did not find the body of the lord jesus and it happened as they were greatly perplexed perplexed about, <clears throat> perplexed about uh, this date that uh, behold two men stood by them in signing Garments. Garments. So they, as they were afraid and bowed their faces to earth, they said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here. What is the reason? Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, and we crucified, and the, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his word, words. Okay, amen. So here we see uh, the actual proof of these women going to the tomb, and the tomb is empty, and the body of Jesus is not there. And um, they were greatly worried and perplexed where um, this um, his body is. And then we see the two angels there, you know, um, and they tell him, tell them, why are you looking for the living among the 
dead. He is risen just like he has spoken to you or just like he said. So just like Christ said, you know, they see the fulfillment and they remember his words and they knew that he spoke about his resurrection. Okay. So we also see uh, proofs of Jesus, uh, you know, being alive after his resurrection. He appears uh, to uh, people, appears to his disciples. Uh, Acts chapter 1, verse 3, uh, we read that. And also 1 Corinthians 15, verses uh, 3 to 8. So again, one of you please read Acts chapter 1, verse 3, and 1 Corinthians 15, uh, 3 to 8. Acts chapter 1, verse 3. To whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many. Infallible, infallible proofs. proofs being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining uh, to the king do dom kingdom of God. of God. So kingdom here in God. Acts chapter 1, uh, we, we see the, you know, um, the disciples themselves saying that, you know, we have, um, you know, proof that, um, you know, uh, where the writer is himself writing, the, the writer of Acts saying that, you know, we have proof that during the 40 days after his resurrection on his time on this earth, you know, um, we, we uh, Jesus himself presented himself alive. And there are many of them who have seen him. Uh, we are proofs of it. And he also, you know, spoke to us or taught us things concerning the kingdom of God. Okay, First Corinthians chapter fifteen verses three to eight. First Corinthians chapter fifteen verse three to eight. For what I received, I pass on to you, as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that He appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. After that, He appeared to more than then 500 of the brothers at the same time most of whom are still living though some of some have fallen asleep then he appeared to james then to all the apostles and last of all he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born yes so here is paul's testimony uh, he's testifying that you know um that Christ died for our sins, according to what was said in the scriptures. He was buried. He rose again on the third day, according to what you know was spoken of in the scriptures. He was also seen by Cephas, by the twelve, and also by the five hundred brethren who you know uh, Jesus speaks about his uh, about the promise of the Holy Spirit after he goes back to the Father, when he tells them to remain in Jerusalem till they receive uh, power till they are endued or and, uh, they are clothed with power. And we also see that after that, he was seen by James and by all the apostles. And then Paul is saying, last of all, you know, I've also seen this risen Christ. When did Paul see the risen Christ? He was not there with the disciples, right, on the day of Pentecost and this one among the 500. So when did he see the risen Christ? Yes, when he had an encounter on the road to Damascus, when he sees uh, Jesus Christ. So he says, you know, um, then last of all, he was seen by me as one born out of due uh, time. Okay, so here even we see that Paul is testifying uh, that he has seen the risen Christ. And also he's given proof of how it was spoken of Jesus Christ was resurrected, how he was seen by Cephas by the 12 apostles, by the 500 people who he said, you know, wait in Jerusalem till you be clothed with power from on high. Okay. So before we look at Jesus being seated on the, uh, the right hand of the father or his ascension, you know, uh, we look at the nature of Christ's resurrection. This is not in your notes, but I'm just giving you additional, uh, you know, notes so you could uh, listen carefully. If you want to make that write down, you can write down. Okay, so what is the nature of Christ's uh, resurrection? Now, Christ's resurrection is not simply coming back um, from the dead, just like when Jesus raised Lazarus back to the 
from the dead, when he raised Jairus' daughter back uh, from, from the dead, when he raised that widow woman's uh, son, you know, back from the dead. Uh, it, this is not the same resurrection that Jesus experienced. Okay, so when Lazarus, when Jairus' daughter, when the widow woman's uh, son was raised back from their dead, they were actually raised back to their same physical bodies, which was subject, which was subject to weakness, which was subject to aging, which was subject to eventually death, which means they were going to die again. Okay, so it was not that they were resurrected in glorious bodies like Christ was resurrected or when we die, we will be resurrected. It's not the same kind. So when people think that, okay, when Jesus raised Lazarus, he raised uh, Jairus' daughter, he raised so many other people back from dead, you know, so he also was raised from, from life to, uh, to from death back to life, but he also would have died one day just like Lazarus would have died one day, right? Or Jairus' daughter would have died one day. But when Christ rose up from the dead, he was not subject again to the weakness of the flesh, to aging, or again to death himself. But when he raised up from the dead, he raised up to eternal life. Because how do we know that? First Corinthians chapter 15, uh, verse 20 says, But when Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. So unlike Lazarus and others who Christ raised up from the dead, you know, Christ's resurrection was different because he, as the scripture says in First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20, he's the first fruits of those who have been risen from the dead. What is the meaning of first fruit? That means the first of the kind. Okay, first of the kind who was raised back from death to life. Okay, unlike the others who Christ raised or God raised back from death to life, they were eventually raised up to the same physical bodies, same weakness, same aging, same death. But when Christ was raised up, he was raised up as the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep, which means, you know, uh, in the same chapter of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, in verse 21, Paul says, death came through a man. That means death came through a man, means he's talking about Adam. So death came through Adam. The resurrection of the dead also comes through a man, and it's talking about which man? Jesus Christ. Okay. So when Jesus rose from the dead, you know, he's the first fruits of life in which a body was made perfect, was no longer subject to weaknesses, no longer, longer subject to aging, no longer subject to death again, but his body was made perfect and was able to live eternally, okay? That is why Paul says in the same chapter of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, when he goes on to write in verse 53, he says, you know, uh, he's put on immortality, okay? We are all mortal beings, but Christ was mortal, put on immortality. So that is the difference between Christ's resurrection and all those who resurrected or who were raised from the dead before uh, uh, him. It's very important for you all to know this because people can argue and say, hey, Christ, God raised him up, but then maybe he would have died some other day and there's no account of it. No, but scripture says that he's the first fruits of those who was raised back to eternal life. Okay. He put on immortality, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 53. And Paul says that the resurrection body is raised imperishable, in glory, in power, and it's a spiritual body. So if you want to study the whole aspect of resurrection, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it's a good passage. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 42 to 44, Paul says that the resurrected body is raised imperishable, in glory, in power, and it's a spiritual body. So when Christ was raised up, the nature of Christ's resurrection was that, you know, he was raised up to be imperishable. He put on immortality, in glory, in power, and he had a spiritual body.
okay, unlike the others who were raised back from the dead. Okay, so that is the nature of Christ's resurrection. Is that clear? Any questions? Any doubts? Okay. So we'll move on to the doctrinal significance of the resurrection. Um, again, this is not there in your notes. I'm just, uh, you know, giving you some additional uh, information and notes. So we look at what is the doctrinal significance uh, of resurrection. The first one is that Christ's resurrection ensures our regeneration. Christ's resurrection ensures means it covers, it assures uh, uh, our resurrection. So Peter, in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, can one of you read that, please? 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. God. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So Peter says that we have been born anew to a, to a what? Living hope. And where, how does this living hope come? Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Okay. So in his resurrection, Jesus earned for us new life just like his. Okay. So in Christ's resurrection, Jesus Christ earned for us a new life, the eternal life, just like his. Now, we do not receive all of this new life. We, we don't... Uh, taste and we don't see, we don't live all of this resurrected life when we become Christians or when we become believers or when we are born again because our bodies remain just the same as we are because it's still subject to weakness, aging and death. But in our spirit man, our spirit man is made alive. Okay, A spirit man is made anew with the life of Jesus Christ. So in our spirits, we are made alive with this new resurrection power. And thus, it is through his resurrection that Christ earned for us this new kind of life we receive when we are born again. Okay. Um, uh, remember, we studied last week that, you know, uh, the whole aspect of justification, right, was because of Christ's resurrection. We look at it, we study it again now in, 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 in some time. Okay. But here in First Peter chapter 1, verse 3, we see that we are born anew. You know, we are born anew in our spirit man because when we are born again, our spirit man becomes alive to the things of God. It's spiritually inclined, but our physical man, that is our soul and our and our body, is still um you know, um, uh, needs to be transformed. That's why we need to transform, renew our minds uh, day in and uh, day out. So our, our, our spirit man, you know, we are made new. We receive this new kind of life. We are born again. And that is why Paul says that God has made us alive together in Christ. Because it's by grace that you have been saved. And it says you have been raised up with him. Okay, we read this in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 5 and 6, uh, and Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. Okay, so when Paul says that, you know, we are made alive together with Christ, you know, what does it mean when we are made alive together with Christ, which means that when we are born again, in our spirit man, we have the life of God, which we received because or as a result of Christ resurrection okay so christ uh, because of christ's resurrection we are also raised up with him remember last week i thought about you know how we identify spiritually with christ's death his burial his um, uh, you know his, uh, his sorry his his uh, his death his burial his uh, his resurrection his ascension and his exaltation how we as believers identify with him spiritually right 
last week I I, I mentioned that in detail. So here we see that, you know, we receive the new life in Christ. How are we able to uh, receive this eternal life? How are we able to live this eternal life here and now? Is because of Christ's resurrection. Because Christ resurrected, we are also made alive together. We become, because Christ resurrected from death to life, we are also transformed from our old sinful nature, our old sinful nature no longer has any um, power, dominion over us. It is dead. We are considered a new creation. That means we are considered now alive, born again in the spirit man. In our spirit man, we have the life and the nature of Jesus Christ. Why do we have it? Because we identify spiritually with what Christ did for us on the cross so paul saying that we may, we were made alive together with christ which means by grace we have been saved but how have we been made alive together with christ because of his resurrection and we are raised up with him which means spiritually we are born again we are raised up in our spirit man even as christ was raised up from the dead okay so paul connects the resurrection of christ with spiritual power within that is at work within us when he tells us in ephesians that he's praying you know ephesians chapter 1 verses 19 and 20 we see that paul is connecting uh, the resurrection of jesus christ with spiritual work within us the first thing we saw that the resurrection of christ is a guarantee is a proof that we are all have the life and the nature of jesus christ in our spirit man the second thing is when we read in scripture, Paul connects the resurrection of Christ with the spiritual power that is at work within us when he writes in Ephesians chapter 1 verses 19 to 20. So, Sean, can you please read Ephesians chapter 1 verses 19 to 20 clearly and loudly, please? After the Lord Jesus had talked with them, he was taken up to heaven yes. and sat at the right, and right side of God. The disciples went and preached everywhere, and the Lord worked with them and proved that their preaching was true by the miracles that were performed. Did you read Ephesians chapter 1, uh, verses 19 and 20, Sean? Oh, no, I'm sorry. Yeah. Can you please read Ephesians 1, 19 and 20? What are you reading? Mark. Wakey, wakey, Sean. Give it to him. Give it to him and let him read so he can. 19. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places? Okay. So here we see that, you know, uh, Paul is saying, what is the immeasurable greatness of his power in us who believe? according to the working of his great might, which he accomplished in Christ when he raised him from the dead and made him sit at the right hand in heavenly places. So here we see that Paul is connecting the resurrection of Christ with the spiritual power that is at work within us. Okay, we'll stop here. Uh, Jackin has, uh, has a good question, which I anticipated, it says, uh, Jesus showed himself after his resurrection to Mary Magdalene and other disciples. So were they actually able to see Jesus in his glory? In one instance, he told her not to touch him, but we see that he still ate with the disciples. So how was Jesus different in appearance before and after his resurrection? Okay, so we'll answer this question break ke baad, after the break. Okay. <laughs> So after the break, we'll come back and I'll answer this question and then we'll move on. Yes. Uh, just a minute. I'll...